All right, uh, so welcome back uh, to another uh, edition of um, uh, us discussing behavior uh, and ABA and all the, the, the good stuff. So today, um, we're going to be getting into terminology, okay? And terminology uh, is going to be a little bit more complicated matter. Um, so we're going to try to simplify all of the behavior terms. I'm going to start one by one because I think, you know, every term kind of deserves its own time in the sun. Now, the thing is, is that um, terminology is a complicated thing because um, the terminology that's used in behaviorism and uh, uh, behavior analysis, it shares the same te uh, terminology that everybody uses, you know? Um, and so that causes a lot of confusion because in layman's terms and everyday terms and everyday use is different from the science of behavior and how that same terminology is used in the field itself. People think that they understand um, the terminology and hopefully as we kind of discuss it, you'll realize like, oh, okay, I didn't quite understand it as much as I thought I understood. Trying to bridge the gap between the science and the everyday language, okay? And so for people that are studying ABA and things like that, I'm not going into the details of it. I'm not going to the nuances between this or that. What I'm trying to do is I'm gonna bridge um, the understanding of what these terms mean in everyday language. Start with our most basic term, which is a behavior. What exactly is a behavior? Now, if you're to ask me what a behavior is, I'll give you the behavioral definition, which is literally it's anything that you do, okay? A behavior is anything that you do in your life, whether it's going out to get the mail, whether it's going to brush your teeth, everything constitutes a behavior. If you're to ask a parent, what is a behavior? What they're gonna tell you is it's crying, it, it's screaming, it's running away, it's hitting, okay? So most of the time when you're talking to everyday people about behavior, most of the time people come to the table with what is really misbehavior or inappropriate behaviors, behaviors that they want to get rid of, you know, and that's much more of um, the, um, uh, the things that parents bring to the table when we talk about behaviors. You can group behaviors in a wide variety of ways. You can group it as like, oh, large behaviors, like, oh, I'm going to work, you know? And the work is composed of all these smaller uh, subsets of behaviors that you do that earn you money, okay? Or you can conceptualize, conceptualize it as very small individual components, okay? Like writing a single letter. We talk about your child and we're talking about their behaviors. We're talking about the whole thing. We're talking about, oh, from the way that they get dressed to the way that they eat to the way that they behave or misbehave. When we talk about those things, we're talking about skills. We're talking about what they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis, as opposed to only talking about their bad behavior that we kind of understand like, oh, when we talk about behaviors, we can talk about anything that somebody does, okay? Then let's segue to some of the more confusing terminology, which is reinforcement and punishment. So punishment and reinforcement refer to what happens to our behaviors, okay? And we're only looking at the results of what's happened. We don't look at the intent of what somebody wants to happen or not to happen. If an event creates a situation where behavior increases, then it's reinforcement regardless of the intent of the event itself. Behavior has gone down or has been eliminated as a result of an event, punishment has occurred, again, regardless of the intent of what the person wanted to happen. What you want to happen is not equated to what actually happened. Let's use an example then, 
Okay. Let's say that uh, there's a teacher in the classroom and this student rips up the worksheet that he's supposed to be working on. And so the teacher wants to punish this behavior by getting, you know, trying to get rid of it. And so they take the student and they put him in timeout. Okay, so they take the student away from the work, they put him in timeout. Okay? And then what happens is that day after day, the student continues to rip up the paper. Okay? So in this instance, the intent of the timeout was to get rid of the behavior. But when you're taking a look at, oh, what procedure, what actually happened in this process, it was reinforcement that occurred, okay? And it was reinforcement, why? Because the ripping up of the paper continued to occur and escalated. It doesn't matter what you want to happen to something, whether you want the behavior to go up or to go down. In the field, if a behavior increases as a result of you doing something, it's reinforcement. If it decreases or goes away, it's punishment. I think that's one of the hardest things to really understand is that the process is determined by the effects. Like, oh, what happens actually tells us what event unfolded. Was it reinforcement or was it punishment? And it really depends on the results of what's happened. And it does not depend at all on what we want to happen. So um, in kind of figuring out what I wanted to talk about for this week, I, it, it's really hard without kind of like, oh, figuring out like, okay, do I go broad strokes with everything or do I go narrow in scope and kind of go into details? But the problem is you can get too much into details and then you lose sight of it all, you know, things like that. And so um, we're trying to balance it both ways. So we're going to go with some of the terminology and I'll go into some detail and we'll flesh things out more and more as we kind of move forward here. We're going to then look at specifically at reinforcement and really what does reinforcement actually entail. Uh, um, the biggest mistake a lot of people make is believing that reinforcement or the things that reinforce us are static events. Meaning like, oh, the things that I like today are the things I'm gonna like tomorrow and the next day and a week from now and a month from now and a year from now. That when we talk about reinforcers and reinforcement, we're talking about static things and that's the completely wrong way to think about it. That reinforcement fluctuates from moment to moment and day by day, you know, and that's true for us and it's true for everybody, you know. Now, how much it fluctuates, the degree of fluctuation, how much things really um, affect our behaviors changes based on the conditions at any given moment of time. Myself, I love eating. I love food. You know, like food drives me, I, like I'll drive long hours, I'll stay in long lines, I'll do, you know, so food is a big reinforcer for me, okay. However, okay, if I haven't eaten for a period of time, the value of that food goes up significantly. If I haven't eaten a specific food item or specific item for a long period of time, that's going to be much more enjoyable for me. It's going to be much more reinforcing for me. Okay. I'm going to enjoy it much more than let's say I just had the fullest meal of my life. You give me the same item and it changes the value of that item based on my condition at that time. When you take a look at reinforcement, how reinforcement occurs is that, oh, when we have pleasurable consequences for our actions. So whatever we do, there's a pleasurable consequence for it. The more pleasurable the consequence, the more enjoyable it is, the more likely we're going to repeat the event. We're just talking about reinforcement so that everyone kind of understands like, oh, when I talk about these reinforcers, reinforcers change and fluctuate for myself, for my wife, for everybody around us, you know, and that you don't remain the same day in and day out from moment to moment, you know? So like uh, my wife, like she loves certain foods, right? And if you get her that food, 
she'll love it and she'll consume it like, oh, every hour, every day. And she'll consume it for a period of time. And then once that period of time is over, then she has zero interest in that food item again for a long period of time, okay? However, if you catch her within that period of time, that item is highly, highly reinforcing for her. She really, really enjoys it. After that moment in time where she has had enough, then it, she couldn't care less about that item anymore. If I'm to use that item that she really enjoys during this moment of time, it's gonna be an effective reinforcer. Anytime after that, then it becomes irrelevant. When we're uh, talking about this kind of, oh, well, re reinforcement fluctuates and, you know, the thing is, is that it's somewhat static and somewhat not, you know, but the thing is, is that to be effective at changing behaviors and promoting certain behaviors, getting behaviors to increase, you have to be really good about identifying what the motivators are. What is the thing that this child enjoys the most at any particular time and use that to support their learning, use that to support their responding.